Okay, uh, thanks again to Sages and to uh, Drs. Gould and I both for the opportunity to um, speak to dear today here at this panel. So uh, this is my disclosure, it's not relevant to this talk. So the objective is basically just to share my algorithm for managing patients with both GERD and gastroparesis. Um, I do uh, preface this by saying this is my algorithm and may not be the same as others. So for everybody else who's also experts on the panel, please don't crucify me before the Jedi Council if I don't completely match yours. Um, so, and unfortunately you will see some Star Wars references here. So if you're not a Star Wars fan, I do apologize about that in advance, but you have made it to the end. So I do appreciate you hanging out for this uh, presentation. So, so why do we even care about a patient with GERD and gastroparesis? You've taken two complex diseases and put them together. And I think one of the most important things is for those of us who treat GERD or, and or gastroparesis is, well, when you have these in the same patient, are you gonna end up with this patient who has severe gas bloating and you're taking care of them for the next five, 10 plus years? So really, is there that much gastroparesis in patients with GERD? And the answer is uh, essentially yes. So there are a couple studies that have been published um, looking at patients who had preoperative um, gastric emptying studies, and we've seen rates anywhere between 20, 30%. Now granted, this is in patients who've shown other symptoms that have uh, caused the investigators to order preoperative gastric emptying studies, and most people do not do this routinely. And the paper from Blair Job and the rest of the consensus and advisory panel actually have not advocated specifically for routine uh, preoperative uh, gastric emptying studies. So yes, um, this does exist, but what do we do now? And part of it is like finding, trying to find Luke Skywalker to fix you know, the, one of the toughest problems in the universe. How do you treat patients with both of these uh, disease concomitantly? So I think the first thing is you gotta make sure you have a correct diagnosis of GERD. I mean, there is a lot of overlap in symptoms, so you wanna have clear objective evidence that the patient does have GERD. Uh, secondarily for me, I also like to know whether or not they have a hiatal hernia and also how large it is because that does go into my decision tree. Um, for the patients then who have some either severe symptoms based off of uh, preoperative screening or uh, things you'd seen uh, EGD with retained food, other sort of objective evidence of gastroparesis to potentially um, um, screen them with a gastric emptying study. And again, I do not do this routinely. I need to um, find some other particular reason as um, s there are several times when patients who have uh, abnormal gastric emptying studies where they actually are asymptomatic from it. That is definitely known. So in a patient who has a normal gastric emptying study, well, you just treat them like your normal uh, GERD patient. And again, you, there are many panels and uh, discussions that you'll hear, see here at SAGES um, um, with that. Uh, similarly, for patients that I do not um, ha have not ordered gastric emptying studies on because I do not think um, that there is clinical evidence of it, I would just treat them as a standard uh, GERD patient. Uh, the patients with the abnormal gastric emptying studies quantitatively and uh, diagnostic evidence of objective GERD, what do you do with these patients? Well, you know, you definitely have, uh, try, to, try to maximize the non-operative therapies. We've heard about medication options. We've talked about endoscopic options. There are many types of options. Um, but for those of us as surgeons, usually we get them when they become refractory. And uh, the, these are the, oh, sorry. These are the tough situations. Sorry about that. So one of the first steps I want to know is, you know, for the patient who has GERD, who has uh, documented gastroparesis, are they morbidly obese? For these patients, I definitely uh, default them to a gastric bypass. It's known to be an excellent anti-reflux operation. And uh, as Dr. Volkman mentioned, the data is somewhat mixed, but it's a good opportunity to try to um, take care of two disease processes at the same time. For the patients with the large parasophageal hernias, even if you do get a gastric emptying study on them, uh, there, there's a certain aspect of it that can be unreliable because of the anatomic location of the stomach. So even if you should choose to get a GS study, um, you can't necessarily say they truly do or do not have functional gastroparesis. So for my practice pattern, what I'll do is I'll first perform the parasophageal hernia repair with a standard fund application, just like I would for any other standard GERD patient and not do any sort of uh, gastric emptying procedure at the time of the operation. Um, you don't burn any bridges with this, and there are a good number of patients who may have overlapping symptoms who actually turn out to have um, resolution after you do the uh, parasophageal hernia repair. 
I think where you get stuck is the patients with the small hiatal hernias or maybe no hiatal hernia who also have GERD and gastroparesis. And this is something where you really have to uh, consider. And I think um, uh, Amber mentioned a couple of the studies looking at patients with either uh, mild gastroparesis or moderate to severe gastroparesis and doing a, um, a gastric emptying procedure at the same time, specifically pyloroplasty. Um, the article from uh, Tim Farrell and Dan Smith and uh, John Hunter when they were back in, uh, uh, in Georgia, um, they looked at, they kind of stratified it into two groups, patients who had a mild gastroparesis and severe. And those who had the mild gastroparesis, um, if they just did the fundal application by themselves, they actually had pretty good resolution of those symptoms. And it was the ones in the severe um, category where they did uh, simultaneous pyloroplasties and in Again, in those patients, they showed uh, pretty good results with uh, resolution of the gastroparesis. Uh, this paper was also pointed out by Amber, but again, it kind of looks like at a moderate sort of gastroparetic group and who had combined uh, anti-reflux operations with pyloroplasty and showed pretty good results in them. So, um, so in terms of my decision making, for those who have mildly delayed emptying on a true study, I still do just a standard anti-reflux operation and see what their symptom resolution potentially is. Uh, for those with severe, I definitely consider loroplasty at the same time. And I would sort of qualify this by saying, you know, you definitely want to eliminate all the opioid use, a lot of the other medication use, and you've already kind of screened those other um, modifying factors out that you really have tried to distill it down to these two diseases. Uh, for the moderate delayed emptying, that's kind of a gray area. So for myself and my practice pattern, I will still try to default towards just doing an anti-reflux operation and basing it off their symptoms post-operatively. Again, you haven't burned any bridges if you should need to re-intervene, uh, re especially operatively. Um, and if you've done the initial operation as a uh, laparoscopic operation. So um, what do you do now when you have the patient who's post-op um, after the standard anti-reflux operation who shows some of these symptoms? Well, um, as a little plug, we do know that patients who have large paraesophageal hernias can develop or sh show evidence of gastric atony afterwards. Um, it's in actually, a in our uh, individual series, we've noticed a little bit smaller percentage than what I would have expected compared to some of the studies looking at GERD and uh, preoperative gastroparesis. Um, what do you do, um, again, though, however, if uh, they do have the symptoms? Well, you kind of start at the beginning of the algorithm again. You try your medical options, you try your endoscopic options, but um, if unsuccessful, then you do have options of pyloroplasty, whether it's laparoscopic or open, potentially POP. I guess, uh, per uh, Dr. Kassemeyer's uh, definition, pacing is probably the wrong word. Again, we're talking about electrical stimulation. Uh, redo patients is a whole other uh, presentation by itself, uh, but you do have to take into consideration specific things. Vagal injury, potential damage from previous operations. Um, definitely be more liberal uh, with gastric emptying studies in patients who have overlapping symptoms, and also considering uh, Roux and Y gastric bypass. Because again, these patients, when we think of redo, specifically for revisional um, or recurrent GERD symptoms or persistent GERD symptoms who may also have a gastroparesis. So in summary, uh, I'm gonna show you my flow sheet now, so if you wanna pull out your cameras, I guess this is the slide that you wanna take a picture of. Send them to Doctors Gould and Eibel. Well, actually, the reason why I put this up there is that, I mean, th these are tough patients to deal with, and you really wanna make sure that you understand the GI physiology, because, I mean, there are opportunities to really, you know, cause patients to have worsening symptoms, and again, once you start operating on these patients, you're gonna have to follow them, and. Um, so therefore, you know, before you try to tackle these patients, you really want to try to um, make sure that you understand physiology really well. So here's the sort of final slide, and I'll end with that. My, again, my first decision-making point is the obesity, yes, no. And then from the no category, do they have a large para? And the answer is no. I kind of look at where they are from the uh, gastroparesis standpoint. Is it mild to moderate? If so, then I default to the standard anti-reflux operation. If it's severe, then I would default to a pyloroplasty at the same time. And then looking at the... Um, sort of post anti reflux patients. Do they have the gastroparesis afterwards? Actually, I didn't update my slide. I had added in here, you know, you try the medical options, you try the endoscopic options, and if that still doesn't work, then consider pyloroplasty. But recognize, you know, you may do your first patient, they may have great outcomes. This is still a very tough disease, and it's uh, still not very well documented what the most appropriate management system is. So, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions also.